This is an arid area already, and climate change impacts in the region are expected to include a decrease in water access, intensification of heavy rainfall events, rising temperatures, and an increase in the frequency of storms. In the Middle East, we're not looking at a 1.5 temperature increase as something to be warded off because it's already happened already. Temperatures here are rising very quickly and climate projections foresee average temperatures reaching unprecedented levels with several areas in the region calculated to reach temperature levels that are frankly going to threaten human survival. And if we look at the figure that you see on your screen right now, you can see an overlay of locations of camps for refugees and internally displaced people with areas that are expected to reach up to 100 days with temperatures above 35 degrees between 2041 and 2060. Above 35 degrees are bodies, especially the bodies of elderly people or people with health issues already, start struggling. So we are looking at an at a region where even just temperatures may become deadly within a very short span of years. And these are in themselves deeply concerning developments and projections, but when they intersect with environment, uh, environmental and natural resources already under severe pressure, as well as the impacts of armed conflict, what we face is a perfect storm of threats to human health, human security, and the ability to keep communities alive and livable. Environmental degradation is already posing a significant threat to the health of people in the region, and nearly half of the total agricultural area in the Middle East and North Africa is exposed already to high levels of salinity, soil nutrient depletion, and wind water erosion. Half of the population of the region is already inhabiting areas with, that are water stressed. And apart from the direct impacts of the human health and the transmission of communicable diseases, water stress exacerbates the impacts of poor soil quality on the agricultural input. And finally, as if degrading water and, and um, um, soil is not already enough, the air quality in the region has declined. Residents in cities and urban settlements in the region breathe air containing a level of pollutants that are 10 times higher than what is safe. This is exacerbated by drought and dust storms that are, make the already hazardous impacts already more uh, dangerous. And this is especially important to keep in mind when it comes to mobility, when we think about the high level of rural to urban migration that's taking place in the region and which is increased by the stresses related to armed conflict and climate change in rural areas. But on top of all of these ongoing processes, you get the environmental damage that is driven by conflict as well. The loss of cultivated trees as well as deforestation these increase soil erosion, desertification, disrupt ecosystem services that are important to food security, and destroy biodiversity. We also see that damage to industrial and petrochemical facilities, infrastructure, as well as waste burning and contamination from weapon constituents are increasing pollution with hazardous effects on people. And while international humanitarian law prohibits deliberate attacks against civilian infrastructure and the natural environment, we have seen example of deliberate degradation of the environment as a method of warfare in this region. And the compounding impacts demonstrated by the illustration you see on the screen before you severely threaten the lives and health of people and communities. They also constrain where people are able to continue living and therefore contribute to mobility as a coping mechanism, but also as an adaptation mechanism. Because of course, what we see is that climate change are making permanent changes to the livability of communities in the region. And the direct pressures that these compounding risks are exerting on people come in various forms. The most obvious one is that it is contributing to inadequate access to resources necessary for survival, such as food or water. And we have to take into account that water availability in the Middle East has decreased by 75% since the middle half of the 1900s. 
it is expected to decrease an additional 40% by 2030. And the rising temperatures and more variable rainfall will lead to an increased exposure to water stress, drought risk, and harvest failure. And these impacts are exacerbated due to conflict-related oh, pollution wait, of water and agricultural land and contamination of land with mines, unexploded ordnance, and IEDs. I think somebody has their microphone on. Maybe you can turn it off. What we, of course, also see is livelihood disruptions both in the urban areas and the rural areas. And this is of course, increasing existing uh, processes of rural to urban migration. But with multiple threats to livelihoods and no alternative options, households and communities engage in coping strategies that can exacerbate environmental degradation, including the felling of trees, skipping meals, the sale of productive assets that are required to take care um, of, of the uh, arable lands or cultivated forests. But what we sometimes forget is also the direct and immediate impacts on ill health and decreased health systems capacity that take place in areas of, affected by armed conflict. What you see in front of you is a figure trying to illustrate the various ways the climate related stresses as well as conflict lead to various health impacts, both directly in terms of ill health, accidents and deaths, but also chronic health undermining uh, issues such as malnutrition or gastrointestinal and diarrheal diseases and impacts on mental health. Combined with the decreased access to health services that conflict lead to, what we see is increased mortality and morbidity even today. And of course, health systems are not the only ones that are affected by conflict and under stress from environmental damage, as well as climate change. We also have weakening environmental governance and institutional capacity. And what happens that is very obvious and which I believe many people in this digital room have already seen is that when you have armed conflict or a large scale disaster, there's decreased government capacity for solid waste management and disposal systems, if it existed to begin with. In the Middle East, the decreased capacity leads to build up a waste and increased risk of transmissible diseases, as well as soil and water pollution. Of course, in the wider range, the limited capacity for environmental governance also leads to limited capacity for larger scale uh, management of, of issues such as transboundary cooperation on water resources in the region, where the water carried by various rivers across several countries are so integral to the survival of uh, rural communities. But moreover, we also see that damage to weather station, insufficient resources, and a lack of qualified technical staff in climate services mean that we have less climate data during armed conflict. And this not only limits the ability to generate climate projections, but of more concern immediately is that you can't get proper weather forecasts. This means both that communities are not able to get the information they need to know when they can plant, but it also means that we as humanitarian organizations have less information about what humanitarian impacts related to weather can arise when. It has to be said that while armed conflict is the primary driver for internal displacement in this region, we, we do see a displacement due to disasters and natural hazards in a number of countries. And what we see is armed conflicts and climate impacts may impede voluntary mobility by restricting the choices and the resources available to populations who would otherwise like to move by slowly eroding the assets and the economy of rural communities in particular, some populations may end up without the resources required to move and be trapped in unsafe circumstances. And it is worth noting that displaced people, no matter the cause of their displacement, are particularly vulnerable to the compound impacts of climate environmental degradation. 
having to leave your home behind, having perhaps lost a lot of your assets and income already due to conflict or to uh, natural disasters, people on the move are often more afflicted by poverty and they are often more often constrained to settle in marginal camp or marginal areas, such as camps or the outskirts of cities where nobody else wants to live. And in the course of our work on this report, we found instances in all three countries of IDP camps that are directly exposed to natural hazards, as well as several instances of camps exposed to pollutants that are hazardous to human health as well. For example, we saw in both uh, Iraq and in Yemen, instances of camps that are located directly or on top of or next to artisanal oil refineries where hazardous ma materials are leaking out. In some cases, this is exacerbated by flooding taking place during the rainy seasons of the year. So in general, what we see are more and more concurrent shocks affecting the most vulnerable populations, such as um, the camp that you are seeing in this picture, which is an IDP camp in Yemen affected by extensive flooding last year. We have our own case study on this in the report, and I encourage you to look into it if you're interested in managing natural hazards in camp settings. What we see in general is that the scale of needs for climate adaptation it vastly outstrips the, the resources of the countries that are the most vulnerable. And what hinders adaptation in countries and areas affected by uh, armed conflict. Well, we see three main challenges. We see that changing unstable and often unpredictable context prevent effective implementation of action. Basically, it's difficult to actually do it. But on a more structural level, what we also see is that these countries are not able to access international climate finance. We also see that a lack of data and evidence to inform adaptation in areas affected by armed conflict means that we're, we're often blundering around in the dark. We don't know enough about the weather and climate to make sure that our interventions match the scale of need today, but also in the future. Climate actors are often lacking information about particularly vulnerable people or in areas that are directly affected by um, uh, but by, by fighting. And finally, we see that if we look at displaced populations in particular, there are uh, major barriers both within the um, legal and practical domains to addressing their needs. Uh, here again, we run into the lack of information, but we also run into HLP issues that prevent us from actually doing um, interventions that actually make a difference in the long run. And we run into the shortcomings of the humanitarian planning and intervention cycles, which are a lot shorter uh, than the ones used by development and peace building. So this hinders effective uh, cooperation. But we also see that there is a severe lack of planning for communities and groups at risk of protect, protracted displacement. Very often we are uh, reactive rather than proactive and um, uh, preventative. Now, of course, not all of these challenges can be addressed by the humanitarian sector. Some of them, for example, financing, have to be addressed by development and climate actors. But some of them can be uh, addressed through some humanitarian action. We can help prevent disjointed international responses by working together with actors in other domains. We can share the information that we have that others do not have. And we can continue to invest in, HL, in managing HLP issues and looking ahead and acting more anticipatorily. We make some recommendations at the end of, of this report. Um, the one that I really would like to highlight for everybody in this room is thinking, okay, what, who do we need to work together with across sectors to strengthen the adaptive capacity of the people in need who we are here to help? We cannot do everything as humanitarians, but we can make sure that we work together and see, well, 
the ones who are working in the development and climate domains, how can we actually contribute our different strengths and leverage different opportunities? If you want to learn more about what I've spoken about today, the report is now out on Relief Web. If you go into the ICRC account on Relief Web, it should be there. There are also a number of other related, um, related publications from the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement lately. The one I'd like to highlight is the one about anticipatory action in refugee and IDP camps. And I think that's just about my 15 minutes uh, gone. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me back to, uh, to my favorite cluster. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Um, we're always happy to have you. Um, thanks for your presentation and uh, for highlighting um, so lucidly uh, one of the, I think, greatest challenges facing the, the humanitarian and uh, development communities uh, and the link between environmental de degradation, climate change, and how that can exacerbate um, conditions for those uh, affected by conflict. Uh, thanks for sharing the links to the report. Um, if you have time, maybe pop it in the chat. Um, and I see there's some comments in the chat um, in response to your to your presentation. Um, if you want to start a conversation with them, please, please feel free. Um, thanks again. Oh, and thank you very much for highlighting um, the uh, HLP issues. There'll be a very interesting presentation later this afternoon after the break on the newly developed uh, HLP and CCCM toolkit that I encourage everyone to stick around for. Um, thank you, Catherine, again so much, uh, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you and continuing this conversation in the future. Absolutely. Thank you.